four, five. What are you doing? Uh, 22 push-ups. Seven. Eight. Why? Uh, because 22 military veterans commit suicide every day. So I'm trying to raise awareness by doing 22 push-ups. How can you raise awareness when you can barely raise yourself? Mm. Having no arms is better than having yours. <sighs> I can keep going. Can you? G.I. Joe began life in 1964 as a tribute to the U.S. Armed Forces in World War II. Clothing and accessories were miniature replicas of the actual uniforms and equipment. This same philosophy was initially applied to the Real American Hero line in 1982, where many of the vehicles and accessories were inspired by actual hardware. For example, Hawk's mobile missile system was in reality the Hawk missile system. The Sky Striker was quite obviously the F-14 Tomcat, and the AWE Striker is the 80s era fast attack vehicle. Many of the vehicles of G.I. Joe drew inspiration from real technology of the period. One of the most evident examples is the G.I. Joe Dragonfly, released in 1983. The preferred ride for Wild Bill, the small attack helicopter is based on the Bell AH-1 Cobra. Yes, in reality, this helicopter is called the Cobra, but despite that, Hasbro wanted to make sure it went to the good guys for G.I. Joe. Where the Cobra is the AH-1, the Dragonfly is the XH-1. Similarly, the Tomcat is the F-14, while the Sky Striker is the XP-14F. Hasbro liked to do this to make the G.I. Joe variants seem experimental. Like a lot of Hasbro G.I. Joe vehicles, the Dragonfly is a fragile toy that's constructed with a snap-fit design, and it has a lot of kid glove parts that you have to worry about. The landing skids like to separate from the toy if you're not careful. Not good, as the skids incorporate the foot pegs for Joes. Why do the top brass allow Joes to hang onto the outside of aerial vehicles in combat, and in front of the missile launchers, no less? It's a madhouse! As with all G.I. Joe vehicles, you have to be careful with the canopy hinge, because they like to break when you least expect it. Early on, there was a chin gun with movable barrels, but it turned out to be either too expensive to make or easily broken, so they fixed the chin guns in place. The Dragonfly has a rescue winch on the bottom, but you have to be careful because they like to seize up, and you don't want to force the cable downward, so it becomes a clunky proposition. I just leave mine rolled up. I understand that Hasbro was looking for opportunities to add play value to their vehicles, but please keep in mind that the Cobra was purely an attack helicopter, and never had a winch on it in reality. Wild Bill sits in the front seat at a very awkward angle due to the cramped confines of the cockpit, and that's only made worse by his big cavalry hat. His co-pilot is one W.C. Colbert, but that's not the name of Airborne, who's his co-pilot on the box. Airborne is one Franklin E. Talltree. Colbert? That's the name of the guy at Hasbro who designed the Dragonfly. The Achilles heel of the toy is in the main rotor. There's an action lever that spins the rotor, and if spun vigorously enough, can sling the red rotor caps right off the spar. But the real problem is in the brittle nature of the rotor clip. If it isn't completely broken already, most Dragonfly rotors have cracks in the clip, and then it's only a matter of time. The best things about the Dragonfly are really all in the aesthetics. It looks like a real military vehicle in that olive drab deco and AH-1 Cobra design, and it really finishes off your headquarters display on the landing pad. Oddly, Wild Bill, despite being the Joe's most colorful pilot in the mythology, wasn't actually a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, despite the Cobra helicopter's big role in Vietnam combat operations. According to his file card, Wild Bill was a LERP combat infantryman in Vietnam. However, Retroblasting happens to know an actual Cobra combat pilot who flew hundreds of combat hours in Vietnam, Melinda's own father, Wendell Mock. With the Dragonfly having been so ubiquitous in the G.I. Joe cartoon when we were growing up, 
we couldn't pass up the chance to ask one of the real wild bills about what it was like to fly the AH-1 Cobra in combat. To really understand the Cobra, you have to look back on it where it came from. It was built by Bell Helicopter, which had built the Huey, the UH-1. And the Cobra was Bell's uh, competition in the fly for the attack helicopter systems. Most of the instrumentation and the limitations and power plants and maintenance and everything else was pretty much based on the existing UH-1, which was incredibly successful. We're still flying them. I think they were designed to have an airframe uh, lifespan of about two or 3,000 hours, and some of them are up to eight to 10,000 already. The G model, which was the first production full combat aircraft and the one that was primarily used in Vietnam, was a lightweight. It was like, God, it was like driving a, a Corvette. I mean, it was very powerful. It was nimble. Uh, it was very responsive. It had a stability augmentation system on it, a computer which helped, helped you maintain the uh, stability because you needed it for firing weapon systems. Uh, it had a 540 rotor system, which was a semi-rigid system. And while you couldn't fly completely inverted, you could go upside down with it. In fact, one of the common tactics was to take, if you were flying over something and you took fire, you pull the nose up and roll the aircraft over on its back, and it was called a return to target. As an aircraft commander, you had a choice. You could sit in the front or the back. And the gentleman in the back normally fired the rockets. because he had the gun sight. And the main control systems were in the back, although there were a set of auxiliary was up in the front. You could arm it, disarm it from the front seat. The front seat's primary mission was to assist in navigation and main helping with radios, and he had the turret, which contained the 7.62 minigun and the 40 millimeter grenade launcher. You also have to understand uh, that that H1G had, you had an option with a turret. You could have two mini guns up there firing three to 5,000 rounds a minute, or you could have, uh, along with that, you could have one 40 millimeter grenade launcher, which would uh, shoot out a 40 millimeter grenade. And that was a very, very effective weapon because uh, you shoot, it was a slow round, and it would continue, those rounds would continue to land long after you were out of range of small arms. So that was a good thing to have, and the Vietnamese feared those greatly. Back seat, uh, people say, well, that was the pilot in command, but not always. And I know as an aircraft commander, I would, in a section leader, I would often fly in the front seat. And what we would do, if we wanted to be able to fire a rocket from the front seat, we would put a little X up there with a grease pencil and use that as our sighting system. So, and it was very effective. The aircraft was very sturdy very strong. Uh, it was it was very unique in a lot of ways. It was only 36 inches wide uh, without the wing stores. Now, you see the little wings on it. They did provide a minimal amount of lift, but they were very strong points for carrying heavy loads, mostly in armament. And later on, they carried tow missiles. Uh, we could carry up to eight tow missiles on it later on, uh, but mostly they were using rocket pods. Uh, one model had a 20 millimeter Gatling gun mounted on the left side. And that thing was fired, it vibrated the airframe so badly that it would shake part of the instruments out loose out of your instrument panel. <laughs> Aircraft was, was uh, air conditioned. It was the only one that I know of in the inventory at that time that was air conditioned. Uh, and it, right behind the pilot's head sat a little compartment that had the air conditioning unit in it. And that went out, uh, it was hot. And it had what it, they call forced air. And the forced air blew, and in the summertime in, in Vietnam, it, it was real hot. It would blow a little, it would blow snow out on you. And it was a very nice thing to have in that, in that type of environment. The bad part about it was, if you lost the air conditioning, the, the uh, environmental control unit, the ECU, went out, it was hot in there because that big canopy was just, it was like a greenhouse. Well, for a while there, I was one of the young, I was the youngest warrant officer on active duty. And I was 18 when I started flight school. Uh, I was 19 when I became a warrant officer. I celebrated my 20th birthday fighting at a place uh, called Ripcord in Vietnam, which is, uh, there's been a lot of 
talk about Ripcord the last little bit, but that was my very first mission was flying at Ripcord. And I remember flying there and uh, coming in and, and uh, I was put in the front seat of a Cobra and I hadn't even been processed into the unit yet. I mean, I walked up there and they said, who are you? And I told them, they said, you're being assigned here get in that helicopter and away we went. And uh, I remember they were surfaced to 6,000 feet solid tracers. I mean, there were tracers going everywhere. We rolled into that thing and my turret didn't work. I had no weapons to fire. So I'm just sitting up there thinking, my God, they could have put sandbags up here. And I could have been having a drink right now instead of this. And I thought to myself, my God, what am I doing here? We would engage any enemy, enemy anti-aircraft uh, positions a lot. And usually they would put those things in triangles. There would be three of them, at least three. And only one of them would fire on you at first. And that's to get you to come in and attack him. And when you did, the other two would eat your lunch, especially if you broke over them. And that's why it was important to have a wing ship that when, when you came in, you would come in and the first one would break and come in like this. And this other one, meanwhile, would be slowing up and getting ready to start his dive. And he would be lined up, but he would be way back up there. So as soon as the main attack air, uh, aircraft, the lead aircraft broke, he could put rockets on the ground to keep those guys heads down while that other aircraft got out and then your wings uh, the lead ship would cover you usually the number two aircraft broke a little bit higher that's to keep them from getting shot my unit did not fly escort missions uh we except for when we were putting uh special forces teams in and we usually shot when we went on our boats uh, when we were coming back they would turn us loose to go hunting but uh, we flew, we called them sorties. And uh, sometimes, some days we'd fly five or six sorties. Uh, some days you would, some months I had to get a waiver. If you had more than, I think it was 110 hours, you had to get a waiver from the flight surgeon to uh, continue flying. He could clear you up to 140 hours. And I, I hit that on a few months. Uh, November of 1970 was especially uh, heavy fighting for us. And, uh, I won two distinguished flying crosses in eight days in November. Usually you don't, when you go on a mission and you shoot, you don't ever see any people because they're hiding from you. They're good at it. And you can shoot, you can, you can shoot and probably kill 30 or 40 people. You never see a body, never see anything. It's just the guys on the ground would find them after you shot. We went in and, and the weather was bad. We went up, up to the place called the Tri-Rivers. If you have a map of Vietnam up in that area, you can see it. And we went into those valleys and got in about the middle of the Ashaw, maybe toward the south end a little bit. And we flew up the Ashaw Valley at about 100 feet off the ground. The weather was bad. My company commander had gotten into the front seat of the a trail aircraft. I was in the lead. But by the time we got up to the north end of the valley where all the trucks were, the calf had been shot out of there. They had lost, a, 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 had two little birds, oh, 086s, shot up bad. Several cobras had been hit, and they had withdrawn. But they had neglected to tell us that. So it was a bit of a surprise when we got to the north end of the Ashaw, and there was nobody there with us. But there were plenty of targets. It was what we used to call a target-rich environment. They were pleased to see us in a way, but not in others. And we saw all the trucks and all the people, and we went hot and fired low angle fire into them and just laid waste and ruin to a whole mess of stuff. We shot a bunch of trucks and people too, and we went up, weather turned to crap. We were coming back down, and there was a section there in the Ashaw that a portion of the mountain jutted out a bit, and there was a cave there. And I don't know if it was a man-made cave or a natural one, but there was a rather large anti-aircraft gun sitting in that thing. And I'm flying down the ash shot at about 100, 100, 110 knots. And I, all of a sudden, I see these tracers right in front of me. And they hit my cockpit. They went through the cockpit. I had my visor down. And they went through the cockpit and shattered plexiglass everywhere and scared the living daylights out of me. 
and I could see them. I looked over and I could see them. They were not very far from me. I saw those Vietnamese on the ground there as after they shot me up, they were pointing to my wingship who was coming behind me and they had him, I surprised them, but they had him dead to rights. They were fixing to kill him. I saw what they were doing and I laid that aircraft off on it, up on its right side, got it to stop pretty much. So I'm hovering out in the middle of the ash hall, basically naked. I've been hit, I don't know how bad, but I know they're gonna kill my wingship. I put about eight pair of rockets in them, those gentlemen, blew that place up and there was a good sized explosion coming out of the side of the hill. So I killed the gun and a mess of people and saved my wingship. And for that, they gave me a Distinguished Flying Cross. March 30th, 1971. I went to Cobra School and I learned to kill. There was no other way out for me. A Cobra pilot is one of the most feared men in the world. The enemy fears us like some people fear snakes. I thought that perhaps that would bring me happiness. It didn't. I faced death every day that I flew against the enemy, and after a while, it got to where it didn't bother me anymore when I saw someone shooting at me. It bothered me even less when I killed them. I learned to be harder than I had ever been before. I had to be hard to live that way. I still do.